we know everyone um, is dealing with stresses beyond anything we would have imagined. Um, in many of you, I see names that are familiar were here with us for the first series, first session in this series. So one of the statistics that really stood out to me um, and a little hard to get my head around is um, increases in mental health issues 3,000% since 2019. Many of us won't argue with that, right? We, we feel it with our family, our coworkers, we're trying to, many of you are supervisors and you're trying to think, how do I support my employees? I'm feeling it myself, right? So today's session, uh, we are delighted to bring together folks who are gonna talk about those things. So how do we deal with um, what's happening to all of us? How can we support each other? How can we support our colleagues? And how do we think about mental wellness as a part of wellness? So one of our goals in this series for sure is to reduce that stigma, right? That notion that somehow, oh, I take care of everyone else. I don't need help. It's not okay to say I need help um, because we all need help. And to be honest with you, um, people feel good when they help you. So it's nice to let people help you. So today's session is uh, another in our series and we'll be continuing. So I'd like to tell you that um, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat and our panelists will see them. We also uh, will be sending everyone who's with us today um, some resources that are right here in the community uh, to give you more information about how to access help or just information. And please always remember, you can call 211 24 hours a day, seven days a week, thanks to our great partners at Contact and get information about anything. So I don't know about you, but two, three in the morning is when my problems seem the most serious. And it's really nice to know that someone's awake and ready to answer that phone to talk to me. So we hope that um, you'll put your questions in the chat. We are gonna do what many think of as a Jamboard, although it's not exactly uh, that tool that we're using, but we're going to be doing that today. And I am delighted to turn the program over now to Dr. Thomas Schwartz, who is a chair and professor in the Department of Psychiatry at Upstate Medical University. Great, uh, thank you. It, it's good to be here uh, to the audience. Uh, thanks for spending some time with us here this morning. Um, yeah, I'll be your, your moderator. Let me let you know what you're in for. Uh, so one of the first things we're going to do is we typically have somewhat of a, a keynote uh, PowerPoint uh, address for you all. We do want to get you some, some facts, figures, and some know-how. So I think it's important to uh, front load today's session um, with, with some of that. Uh, I'll introduce Dr. Ron Fish here uh, in a minute. He will be our speaker. Uh, after that, we'll switch over to a little bit different format. Uh, I have three uh, expert panelists um, that I'll introduce later as well. And we have questions that I will pose to them to kind of share information in a little bit uh, of a different format. Interposed between some of these, you'll see some PowerPoints come up where we pose a couple of questions to you, the audience. Uh, so there's a little bit of, of audience participation or, or activity here today. And then we'll wrap it up. So that, that is what you're in for. Uh, it is an important topic. Uh, again, I'm, I'm glad you're all here. So to uh, move our program along, let me uh, introduce you uh, to a, a friend and colleague of mine who I've known many, many years here in Syracuse, uh, Dr. Ron Fish. Uh, he's a psychologist. He's the clinical director for psychological health care. Uh, I suspect one of the largest uh, psychotherapy providers in, in the greater Syracuse area. He specializes in programs integrating uh, behavioral health and medical care. Um, as I mentioned, he, he's a clinical psychologist with experience in many, many areas. Um, he is a master trainer for the trauma resiliency model uh, with expertise in, in treatment of patients with complex trauma. He works in many different areas uh, across the, the greater Syracuse uh, area. Uh, I don't know how he does it with only you know, 24 hours in a day. So uh, Ron, uh, thank you for being with us today. Let me turn it over to you and uh, you can start your slideshow. So I really am delighted to be here. I uh, was pleased to be asked and I'm honored to be included uh, as co-panelists with such fine people and for what you're, such a wonderful cause. Um, I, was, I was originally asked 
to uh, talk about burnout. That was the original uh, title that I had on this, but I think this is a this is a kinder title. But yeah, we're going to be talking about burnout. And my goal is to, um, by the end of the talk, give you uh, specifics about what burnout is, and then an overview, kind of a new neuroscience sense images about um, what, what it's like to be in a, a state of burnout versus a state of wellness and what to do about it. And so I'll be moving through quickly. So pre-COVID, I think Nan mentioned this really, really well. Um, Pre-COVID, my uh, friend of mine, Dr. Mickey Leibowitz and I were asked by uh, people at Excellus to go around and give uh, dinner talks to physicians and their partners about physician burnout. And we use this uh, Medscape data from a report that had just been released. And this was right before COVID hit. And so I just wanted to show it to you because as I was going through uh, preparing some slides for this talk today, it really hit me. This is the slide we showed. Um, and it was fun for the physicians in the audience to compare their, where they were compared to their, their colleagues and other uh, medical subspecialties. And you see that it went you know, from the, those people identifying as self-identifying as burned out from a low of 29% in uh, actually public health medicine, they haven't had a rough time recently, up to 54% in urology. So pre-COVID, 29% to 54%. Two weeks ago, as I was preparing for this, I received the, the latest issue of medical economics and these statistics came out. And so just using this population of people, of course, who've been on the front lines, but it went from 29 to 54% to 80% of physicians feeling burned out, 94% admitting it at some time in their career and 78% thinking about, I'm done, I gotta go. And so, as we talk about burnout in the workplace, and the thing is that burnout is a definition specifically about how our workplace is affecting us. Burnout is a term about the workplace. It's not a, a, diagnostic, a diagnosis, it's not a DSM diagnostic uh, term. It's not depression, it's correlated highly with depression, but it does not equal depression and it's and it's de defines and describes um, situations at work. So Christina Maslach is the person she uh, developed the Maslach burnout inventory. She's a social psychologist from uh, Stanford, I believe and it's kind of it's kind of an interesting little backstory how the, how this her interest in this came about. Because uh, in 1973, Philip Zimbardo did his prison experiment. And for those of you who are new to this or who might uh, need to remember what he did, you know how in, uh, when you take your intro to psych classes uh, in college, you have to do 10 units of volunteering. This is how the psychology professors get their subjects. And so Philip Zambardo, a social psychologist, uh, got volunteers to participate in a prison study because he was very interested. You know, they're talking about the concentration camps, the brutal uh, guards in the concentration camps, and also some reports of sadism in this country or throughout wherever there's guards and prisoners. And so he was wondering, is it the environment that creates these characteristics in guards and also prisoners, or is it more personal? So he thought, okay, I'll create an artificial prison, which he did. He brought students down, they, they had them arrested and then brought down to a basement at Stanford University that was ginned up like a, a prison. He had guards and he had prisoners. And the, the study was supposed to last two weeks. Well, one of his colleagues in the social psychology department 
was up in arms. As you saw, the kids started decompensating uh, very quickly. Guards started acting like guards. Prisoners started feeling like prisoners. So she, um, her critiques, he credits her critiques as causing him to shut it down in six days. Um, and then as the story goes, they started dating and then they got married. So from that, developed her interest in how our environments really affect us. So she developed the Maslach burnout inventory, which is the most widely used by a, by a long shot inventory. I, I've used it. Uh, many people have used it for their staff. And there's three categories. One is about energy, personal energy. The second is about our satisfaction, what we're doing. And the third is how we view the people we're uh, doing it with, working with. So emotional depletion or exhaustion is number one. There's a physician I knew uh, in a cognitive subspecialty, he had her own practice and she would, uh, Patients loved her, referral sources loved her, family members loved her. She would start working with her first patient in the morning and somebody would come in who needed a little extra time. She would be very focused with that person. And then she, she sometime in the morning, she'd look at her watch, she says, oh my gosh, it's 9.45. I'm already 45 minutes behind. And then the press of her patients, the rest of the day would be like this thousand pound yoke around her neck and she would just feel more and more pressured. And then she'd go through a week and by Friday afternoon, it was all she could do to basically crawl home. And she'd go home, get a little uh, um, energized on Saturday and then by Sunday have a serious case of the Sunday blues. So after talking, we realized you know, a better work environment would uh, be less pressurized for her and she changed. But the first, the first characteristic of burnout is this just sense of exhaustion, hard to get out of the bed, hard, just sometimes hard to move. So second is a loss of the uh, loss of meaning, loss of satisfactions. Why am I doing this? Why am I here? I used to be good at this. Um, and this is especially triggered by uh, people who get complaints, people who have had lawsuits, people who have been fired, who are on probation, um, and uh, people who are uh, subject to internet trolling. And it's like, why am I doing this? Um, it's not what I thought it was going to be. I'm not really helping the world. What, you know, this, this issue about meaning and purpose, why am I doing it? Why am I on this earth? You know, it gets to spirituality. And uh, my wife is a professor at Syracuse University in the graduate department. She really loves the interaction with students. And many of her colleagues were actually happy to do the, the virtual teaching, but my wife really likes the, the back and forth, the give and take with the students, and the stimulation of that. And uh, not this semester, but last semester it was all virtual, and she couldn't sense a connection with the students. Like, I don't really know how you all are reacting to what I'm saying. And she started wondering, why am I doing this? I don't know if I'm getting through to them. I don't know what they're learning. I don't know if they're interested, stimulated, intrigued, bored, checking their phones. And so she started going down this path, number two. And then determined after some conversations that she decided to have discussions with the students to try to work this out to say hey this is what I'm struggling with and so they developed some strategies like students would keep their cameras on would keep their uh, microphones on would take responsibility themselves for creating that give and take and that she would say if she was at sea in terms of how they were reacting the third is depersonalization, which is what it sounds like. You don't see the person in front of you. Cynicism is where you think the person's out for their own self-interest. They're just out to get you. 
viewing people distantly, uh, the deep kind of the definition of depersonalization would be like that gallbladder in room six, as opposed to that nice uh, Mrs. Jones, a 56 year old woman who came in the other day. Um, and it's interesting to me when I do consultations at in different settings of where there's conflict between, between people, it seems to always start with this depersonalization that we stop viewing the other person as a person. You know, it's a loss of compassion and empathy. It's they don't work as hard as us. They don't understand us. They, you know, it's a, it's a they, it's, the, it's other, otherizing people. Will Rogers said, I never met a man I didn't like. And I've always interpreted that to mean once you start to get to know someone as a person, then of course you're gonna like them. So the second part of my talk, what, I, what I'd like to do is now enter the, the neuroscience. And this is when I when we did the, the, uh, the talks with the physicians and, and Mickey, this is what they loved and remembered, this idea of a resilient zone. And um, resilience is a state of well-being in mind, body, and spirit. When we're in the resilience zone, we're able to handle the stresses of life. So I just think of it as this two parallel lines with a sine curve there that kind of indicates our energy level. And just to give you a uh, sense of that, so remember I'm a psychologist, so you know I do things like that. So I'm going to ask you to to go along with me. And I can't see you to know if you are, but, but I really encourage you to do it. So first thing I'm gonna ask you to do is just pick up, if you have something to drink, just pick it up. And I'm gonna ask you to notice the weight of what you're holding, the angle of your arm, and then to bring it slowly to your mouth and notice the uh, smell, you know, the aroma. And then as you drink it, what it feels like and tastes like in your mouth and then down your throat. Just to take a moment to really notice that. And then I'm gonna ask you to put it down and then with whatever hand you choose, I'm gonna use my right hand. Explore the edge of your screen. So, uh, for example, I have my thumb on the uh, side that I can see of the screen and my four fingers behind the screen. I'm just going to ask you to notice the color of the border of your screen. And to, really, to really look at the color and the shading and then to let your fingers explore the texture of the screen. To notice the, the edge where the, the screen hits the, where the, uh, you know, the, the metal, the aluminum hits the far edge and ends. And then where the border hits the screen, probably indents a bit. Just notice it with your fingers. Notice how your four fingers work, how they work together, how they're independent. Notice the temperature of the screen that your fingers are sensing. Notice how far up your fingers, your hand, the temperature sensations go. And then compare that temperature to what you feel on your cheek. Notice if there's any sense of air movement on your face or where in your face it's more or less. And then take a moment and notice if there's any part of you inside that's a little bit calmer than a minute ago. and where you might be a little bit calmer or a little less activated. 
Notice if your breath is a little bit deeper or not. And if it is, then that would be a sense of that resilience zone. Because the thing is that <clears throat> we can go into that resilience zone, but it's not going to last, does it? We're all going to get triggered because life is what it is. And it's actually um, uh, <clears throat> you know, biologically engineered into us to keep us safe, that when there is a threat, our sympathetic nervous system prepares for action, increases our heart rate, makes our vision better, uh, sends more blood pumping to the, the large muscles of our shoulders and, and legs so we can fight or run away. Um, and then when the threat is gone, then we, our parasympathetic system calms us down. This is what happens over and over and over. And this is what you see with uh, in a work environment where there's distress, there's some danger that the staff perceive and they are alarmed and they're on guard and they're fighting or running away. You know, either they're in fight mode, they're prepared for action. And then hopefully there's intervention and they feel safe. And this is another way of thinking about that. There's a traumatic or stressful event that happens and some of us go into what I call a high zone. We get edgy, irritable. And this is a the PAMP. This is, these are graphics from the Trauma Resource Institute that, that Dr. Schwartz mentioned, who I work with. Uh, people in the high zone get edgy, irritable. They, they might get panicky, angry outbursts. This is when our, we happen to notice our pain more. Or we might go into the low zone where we, we get depressed, low energy. Maybe we just want to go home and pull the curtains and not talk to anybody. And burnout could be where we get stuck in the high zone or we get stuck in the low zone. Or if you're like me, I go back and forth to both. Of them. And so in a period of high stress, like in the example of my the physician that she would start maybe on Saturday, she would have her, her widest resilience zone. Then Sunday would start to narrow. She'd go into work on Monday, be narrower, and then through the week until by Friday, it was like razor thin. And I think what's happening in this country, maybe in the world, I've never seen it so much. You know, Tom mentioned psychological health care. We have 70 mental health providers. We talk about a lot of uh, people who we, whom we treat. And it seems like everybody's resilience zone is just very narrow. You notice that when you're driving, you know, the drivers are, are less, have less patience and tolerance. And you see it all over and it's gonna be uh, in the workplaces too. And the goal really is to help to widen those resilience zones. So over and over and over to sense those resilience zones, it's really how much frustration tolerance, how much pe ability people have to bounce back from a difficulty. Um, so if we, if we think back to the definition of, of burnout, that the first was the uh, energy depletion, right? Emotional depletion or exhaustion. So, um, the management support could be um, resilient zone wideners, things that help supply more energy, celebrations, breaks, stretching, an emphasis on what makes us feel just a little bit better. What's going to be a lift to people? And then the second is emphasizing effectiveness. So the uh, you know, definition of burnout was that reduced work-related satisfactions, loss of meaning and purpose. So really, why are we here? So we have a, an intake department. Um, they're, they're our first line when people call us to, to initiate services and for them to know how important they, they are. You know, and if you go into any 
practice, any really, any any place of business, that first person who greets you really sets the stage, right? They give you an indication. We all generalize from that person to, oh, this is a nice place, or oh, I'm going to be treated well here, or oh, the coffee's going to be good here, or the the uh, service is going to be good. So really letting each person um, get feedback, giving each other pe uh, people feedback about um, how they make a difference. And then um, personalizing it. So really being aware of um, us versus them, and you know, it's kind of interesting, the uh, in terms of the depersonalization, the cynicism, some studies, some people say, well, the supervisor really has the most impact. Some studies show that it's the, when colleagues are uncivil to each other, that's when that I don't care attitude shines forth uh, most. But so, um, encouraging uh, people to see each other as people. I mean, that's the easiest way for me to think about it. And so I have no idea how the time is, but I just want to tell you, this is something that I do to widen my resilience zone. The uh, Lou Berger is a comedy group, and I don't even know if people want to get out, but I'm going to be on Friday. I'm going to be at uh, Wildflowers and Armory. This wild-haired guy on the, the right is my son, Huey Stonefish. And uh, so I encourage everybody to um, start tracking your resilience zone. Notice when it's narrower and notice what you can do to come into the present moment typically and widen that resilience zone. So I'll stop here. Great, uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Ron. Appreciate your, uh, your time here with us and, and the information. Um, so I think um, I'd like to switch to one of those audience participation modes here and I'll, I'll see if Lewis can put one of our first uh, Mentimeter questions up. And if you'll see in the uh, chat window, there is a uh, link you can hit. And the question to be posed really is, what percentage of your employees or colleagues do you think are experiencing some level of burnout? So if you could log in and just want to get a sense of what, what you're seeing in your workplace. Uh, Ron and I work in healthcare, and you saw some of the data we're alarmed about. Um, you and the audience all work in, in different areas uh, with different, uh, different companies and yeah, so the number seems to be um, anywhere from kind of using Ron's uh, data approach there, 21% to maybe even upwards of 100%. So we're shifted to the right. Um, and, and that seems comparable to the, the position data uh, Ron was sharing. Okay, good. Well, thank you, everybody. And, and again, uh, so now we know where we're standing at. Seems like some, some common ground. Uh, we all seem to recognize that uh, burnout and sometimes a, a lack of wellness in the workplace uh, certainly exists, uh, and, and COVID hasn't helped that much. All right, so let me let me move on. I'd like to introduce um, my uh, outstanding uh, set of panelists here today, and then I have some questions. We're going to kind of go round robin and and ask them. Um, so uh, I'll just introduce all all three panelists briefly, and then we'll get down to firing off some of our questions. So uh, we're joined I, uh, by Dr. Asleen Tibet, who's an assistant uh, professor of emergency medicine here at Upstate Medical. Uh, she is a dual board certified uh, pediatric emergency uh, room physician, uh, certainly a hardworking uh, junior faculty member uh, here at our organization. Uh, and you talk about front lines where, where COVID is hitting. Uh, she's been over in that atmosphere now for, for a long time. She's also one of our uh, kind of junior deputy wellness officers. I've met her through our wellness committee. 
Um, she has uh, extra training in that area. So it, it's, it's great to, to bring you on board with us today. So welcome. Um, we next have Ms. Rochelle Lando, uh, Coordinator of Healing Arts and Language Services in the Office of Patient Experience at uh, St. Joseph's Health. Um, she has worked uh, there for 13 years and has been building a healing arts program and optimizing the language services uh, program. Um, she's a coordinator of the colleague care team there that was instituted at the beginning of the pandemic to ensure all colleagues feel supported during everyday stressors and the continual transformation of healthcare. Uh, so welcome and we're happy to have you here as well. Uh, Ms. Michelle McCormick is next. Uh, over 20 years experience um, designing and managing uh, employment uh, benefit uh, plans and programs at SRC uh, with a clear focus on health and welfare plans. She's worked for a large health insurer and global employee benefits consulting firm prior to transitioning to the employer side. Um, she's included, uh, has worked for companies such as uh, Bausch & Lomb, Harsco, and, and SRC managing benefits and wellness programs. So we have three expert panelists here uh, who live in this world every day. And, and so I think we can get started. Is everybody ready to handle some questions? All right. Um, so uh, according to my list, uh, Rochelle, you're up first. Um, so how does an organization start building a culture of well-being and self-care? How does it start? So for St. Joseph's Health, um, and I think maybe for your organization, it's sort of asking how is your organization going to structure this wellness initiative and this wellness um, group. Um, for us, we do follow the res resilience model, just like you know Rob was talking about. And really that's the self-awareness, mindfulness, self-care, relationships, and purpose. So we actually formed a group of uh, colleagues from all different um, departments. We have, you know, human resources, our community health and well-being, uh, chaplains, um, administration, behavioral health, and some clinical staff. So it's a part of what we we do in every day. It's people that are passionate about wellness, and so we came together to form a structure of rounding. Um, mainly on staff to have those conversations like Rob was talking about, self-care, self-awareness. And I think in the beginning, it was a little, you know, people were like, what, you know, what are you doing? You know, what are you, you know, sort of asking about? And, and it was sort of, I think, new to people for us to have these conversations and bring it to the forefront of saying that this is important their health and well-being is important to us. And then how can we support it as an organization? How can we, um, you know, sort of support them in exploring what wellness means to them? So really it's that consistency and then it's saying, forming a group, however that looks, of consistency of rounding, continuing um, throughout our system to make sure that we sort of have these conversations with our colleagues. And I think, again, I think Nan mentioned, she, she asked, how do I even support colleagues if I'm struggling? And I think sort of our, our whole conversation today is they have to do it for themselves too. Um, so that's, you know, walking the talk. So they're modeling that health and wellness um, sort of being presence. So thank you. Thank you. Um, the next question is for Asleen. Um, outside of EAP programs, um, uh, many companies are creating what's called a chief wellness officer, CWO. Uh, what, what, what do CWOs do? What's their training like? What if you don't wanna do all that kind of training, um, but you wanna be informed as an employer? So tell us about the world of CWOs and how that works. Uh, thank you for the question. I think the chief wellness officer role is extremely important. Uh, first off, the fact that it is a C-level um, chief role just tells your institution that wellness matters, right? So we have a chief wellness officer, you have a chief um, executive officer, a chief informations officer. So we all know that those roles are important, but having a designated individual whose primary role is staff wellness is extremely important. 
So this person, in addition to the resources that are already available through HR, um, his job is to improve on the well being. So, as uh, Ron mentioned, this is someone who's going to address emotional exhaustion. This is someone who's going to help make the job more personalized for people so that they don't suffer from depersonalization. And this is someone who's going to work on the ground level to help improve personal achievement. So, currently, there isn't a formal training in the sense that. There isn't a master's degree in wellness or a PhD in wellness. There are a lot of fellowship programs offered. Um, Stanford has done a lot with wellness. And so they offer a lot of programs uh, for fellowship classes that you can take online or right now, especially online um, to just improve your awareness and to educate you on what's out there in terms of physician burnout, healthcare burnout, other forms of burnout outside of the healthcare industry. And so I think that's really important to take up advantage of those opportunities. For those individuals who don't wanna be a chief wellness officer, but who would like more information on wellness, I think you can still take these um, classes. Some of, them, some of them are free, they're very short. So six to eight week programs, some are a lot longer, some are six months a year. Um, so I think there's something out there for everyone if you just want to improve your education of well-being. I personally think it you can't help others until you help yourself. So I've taken some of these classes and I've learned so much about myself. And now I can relate it to my coworkers within my own department, within the larger industry. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, Michelle. How does SRC approach workplace wellness and what are some of the things you're doing to support employees there? Sure, um, thanks for having me here today. Um, so SRC has been following a very typical employer model when it comes to wellness of having three pillars, um, physical wellness, financial wellness, and then mental and emotional wellness. So. Um, when the pandemic started, we really ramped up our focus on mental and emotional uh, wellness supports. So we're very fortunate. Um, we have an on-site counselor, like an in-house EAP, um, and you know, obviously promoted his availability. And then he also did a series of uh, Learn at Lunch webinars for us on a variety of topics, burnout, stress and anxiety, dealing with the unknown, um, all kinds of things. And so those were pretty well attended. Um, we were very pleased with those. And then um, right before the pandemic started, uh, we were, um, so we use Excellus as our medical plan uh, TPA and their relationship with MD Live um, for telemedicine was, it was just perfect timing. They had rolled out um, behavioral health counseling um, as part of their model. And our plan offers telemedicine with zero copay. So we were able to promote, um, you know, the ability to talk to a counselor, you know, same kind of access that you would get in a, through our medical plan, um, but do it from the privacy of your own home. You can sit in your car at lunch, you know, whatever it is you want to do. Um, so that was really great to be able to offer that. And we had pretty good uptake on that um, and sustained uptake. So that was also really great. Um, we do a, uh, we have a lot of video training courses that are available for our employees through our learning management system. And um, they have a catalog of every kind of course you can imagine, but they have a great selection of wellness courses, including a lot of TED Talks about wellness. So we do a video pick of the week and we put that out to our employees in our, um, our daily newsletter, online newsletter. And we get a surprising number of hits on that as well. And then one of the things that we thought was really important was to continue to promote physical activity because we didn't want people kind of falling into that low zone that Dr. Fish talked about and just languishing, you know, in front of their computer for 14 hours a day or whatever it is. So um, we offered a lot of virtual um, fitness courses online courses, um, you know, for example, we partnered with the American Heart Association and had one of their representatives do a desk or size um, lunchtime class for us. And again, it was a great free community resource. Um, and she was, she was 
fabulous. We had really good turnout for that. So just a lot of little ideas like that. Good, good. Thanks. Um, Rochelle, you had mentioned earlier kind of this rounding model. Um, what do you do with remote workers? How, how have you all handled that approach? Um, well, a part of our colleague care team would also, we, we say rounding, or we would have the list of remote workers and we would check in with them. Uh, we did different strategies of really calling remote workers. We would call um, managers. And again, it's getting that connection. I think we had many that they were surprised. We reached out to them to check in with them to see how they were doing. Um, and that we would do that consistently um, throughout the pandemic. Um, and then also checking in with managers. And as, as you know, Nan said, you know, how am I going to lead in this space if I'm struggling? So we would check in with the managers and leadership and then provide, again, sort of that support, you know, of resiliency. We have a tips card of, and we would send that to our uh, remote workers. And it's those simple things. I think sometimes people think the resilience model or self-care, self-awareness has to be hard or challenging. And it's really simple things of taking care of yourself. People don't think that, you know, taking a breath, you know, just like Rob did those little mindfulness check-ins. They, they don't sometimes think of that as self-care. So the connection with remote workers and through workers throughout the system is important because we want to make sure, you know, everyone we, we touch upon and really they're the ones where we get the feedback, sort of what, what are they struggling with? What can we help them with? Um, what, what do they want, you know, or what do they need um, of, of things that we could provide to them? So I think it's it's really not ignoring remote workers, furloughed workers at the time that we had those, but um, it's making sure that we touch base with with everyone. Good, good, agreed. Um, let me switch gears a little bit and uh, come back to Esleen. You know, we've been talking about burnout, stress, resiliency, people being irritable in the workplace. Uh, dysfunctional, maybe even depressed in the workplace. Uh, you and I work in a pretty stoic field where we're not supposed to ask for help. Um, and the other thing is then we have stigma. You know, what if I admit I'm depressed, burned out? Um, do you have any ideas about stigma in the workplace? So we want people to reach out. If you're in trouble, we keep saying this again and again. Uh, we build all these great wellness programs. And some people have a hard time reaching out due to stigma. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think um, that's a great question. So I think the most important way to eradicate stigma is to just address it, right? So um, anti-stigma and awareness campaigns really do work. So just telling that, so I work in the emergency department. I don't think it's a surprise to anyone right now in the climate of the pandemic that there is a lot of stress on our frontline workers. So just it, you know, addressing that when we have faculty meetings, you know, I just put it out there. I say, guys, we've had our volumes are astronomically high. How's everybody doing? And that way, people, and once one person talks in a group, everyone starts to realize that oftentimes we all feel the same way. We're all feeling overwhelmed. We all may feel undersupported, understaffed. At the beginning of the pandemic, uh, PPE was limited. And so there was a concern that. Are we protected at work? Are we gonna go home and get someone at home sick and so on? So just having, as was mentioned previous um, by Rochelle, just having check-ins with staff, having workshops, making it more apparent that these are concerns in our field. Unfortunately, there was an ER physician in New York City about it within the past year who unfortunately committed suicide because of the stress of COVID. So just addressing that, you know, saying, hey, guys, look, we lost a member of our field in New York City due to COVID. How many other people are feeling that way right now? And just talking about suicide, talking about addiction, talking about depression, giving people the facts that these things exist. You know, the emergency medicine literature, especially during COVID, shows that burnout in emergency medicine physicians is twice that of their peers. Right, and the ICU physicians are a close second. That's not where you wanna be on the list of top one and two. So just addressing this and bringing the information to the group, making them aware that these are issues that we face, making them aware that it's a common issue 
and making them aware that you're not a worse physician or you're not a weaker physician because you're having these issues. Usually that I think helps to normalize, if you will, the environmental stressors. Thank you. Um, Michelle, I think we have uh, time for one other question. Um, what things um, are you doing that seem to resonate most with your employees? So what's your like top 10 list or top three list? Do you think? Uh, well, we've definitely had varying levels of engagement and interest with different things that we've tried. Um, we haven't been afraid to try and fail, right? Because you never know what's going to resonate. And sometimes you have to do it more than once. Um, so uh, we have done things like virtual trivia nights and virtual happy hours, um, virtual beer tastings. Um, um, and some of those, like the trivia contests, when we first offered them, uh, it was a, last summer, June-ish, phenomenal response. We, I mean, they had to add sessions and add space for more teams, and it was great. And then they did it again this year and the interest had sort of dipped. Um, so you just never know. But um, probably the most successful wellness event that we did was a two session lunchtime webinar with our legal counsel where he talked about legal documents that everybody should consider having, healthcare proxies, living wills, um, powers of attorney. In, and that we had phenomenal attendance at that because it was just the right message at the right time. People were nervous about the what ifs of the pandemic. And this was a way that they could take a little bit of control and feel like they were um, protecting themselves and their families. So that was a really great event. Um, and you know, we've just embraced Zoom. It kind of instantly became the way that we would connect with people. So you can see my background. We have a phenomenal team of um, of creative folks who put together all these different Zoom backgrounds for us. And we just have a lot of fun with it. You know, people get to put up their likes and dislikes and, or, you know, if they want to look like they're on the Starship Enterprise or any of that stuff. So we, we just had tried to have as much fun with it as we can. And as Dr. Fish said, we do um, enforce a cameras on rule um, at all times because we feel like that visual connection is really important with people, so. Good. Uh, thank you. Uh, panelists, I do appreciate your time. Um, Ron, I want to turn it back to you for a quick comment. If you have one, then we'll pose a new question to the audience. I wanted to add to the doctor's uh, insightful comments about reducing stigma. I've been working with the um, Syracuse Police Department for the last six years on a peer support team where they reach out to each other. I'm really proud and respectful of them that they're doing this to try to improve the, the mental well-being of their officers. And when they have a critical incident, which sadly is, is uh, more often than any of us would like, we do critical incident stress debriefings in which the officers are invited, not mandated, to share their experiences of the situation and how it impacted them. And one thing I've noticed is the importance of modeling, you know, the idea of the speed of the boss is the speed of the crew, that when there's a, a person with some authority, and in this group, of course, it's very um, clear, sergeant, lieutenant, when there's a person with some authority, and he or she shares their personal experience, <clears throat> oh, this happened to me, and oh, my gosh, this affected me like this, then we have this terrific, uh, debriefing session where everybody's participating. When that person in authority that everybody's taking their cues from is tight-lipped, they don't go as well. So, so modeling and giving the idea that, hey, I did it and it really helped me. I think that's the best way to, one of the best ways to combat stigma. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, let me turn it back over to Lewis. Let's see if we can put up our next um, Mentimeter question. Um, so we all wanna learn from you. And you know the question that, that is um, coming up in the link in the chat box is, you know, what are you doing at your workplace to promote wellness or create connections? 
And so we'd like to collect, uh, you know, certainly a short meeting here. We all have plenty of ideas, but the panelists, Ron and myself, we don't have all the answers. Well, what other things are out there? I like the National Ice Cream Day. Uh, when the summer hit, I rented an ice cream truck uh, every Tuesday for like six weeks. So part of it is I'm addicted to ice cream, but it was outside and people got to meet each other and we haven't seen each other face to face in you know a year. So I like the ice cream approach. Breaks, short walks, self-care plans. Yep. Use your, your time benefits. Like nobody took vacation for at least a year, right? Shared missions, celebrations, good. Yeah, I, I knew how bad it was when my first year residence started in the middle of a pandemic and I only knew them through Zoom and teaching. And I randomly, uh, as some of, the man, uh, some of the rules were lifted, I ended up getting in an elevator and this resident and I look at each other and you know, he looks and he goes, Dr. Schwartz, you know, um, man, you're taller than I expected. So, you know, we only know people from the, the shoulders up, right? Um, so it just it dawned on me how, how horrible it's been not seeing people. So a lot, of, a lot of your comments have about, you know, yep, getting people together, making connections, checking in. Good. Well, thank you. Well, we are approaching the uh, end of our time here. Um, so again, I, I don't have too many closing comments. We have an expert uh, keynote speaker, panelists, and you as the audience also have some expert ideas that are we're coming in through the screen. So uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to put uh, Lewis to work here uh, and then pop up our, our final question, uh, which will end up being, you know, what would you like to hear about in future sessions? So if you could uh, go to a, a new link once it's posted in the chat box, uh, we'll spend our last two, three minutes here seeing what ideas you have for uh, future teachings, panel discussions, content areas. So if you could um, go ahead and click on the, the newest link and let us know what you're thinking, because we'd like to put together stuff that you want to hear about. So some of the topics are starting to populate here. So um, addiction issues, um, yep, the mindful activities. It, it is amazing if you can take a minute or two, <laughs> take a break from everything. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad Ron did that exercise with us. Uh, barriers, um, dispar disproportionate impact of burnout, um, how to get help when not supported by management. Returning to the workplace, all good ideas. All right. Yeah, <laughs> being working parents and having kids with issues, stress reduction. All right, well, thank you. Um, again, we're rolling up on, on our final minute of two. Uh, again, it, it's been great to be here. Thanks for letting me uh, moderate with, uh, with such a great group of uh, speakers. Um, you got a great team behind um, this event and other ones putting all these things together. Uh, you know, we meet a lot. They coordinate, organize. They, they make things uh, today uh, very easy for me and, and the other speakers. So thank you. And uh, those of you uh, out there, hopefully you'll, you'll find this helpful. And we'll keep putting content together to, to try to help you out. Um, have a good day and, and find some time to, uh, to be well, to stay in the theme of what we were talking about. So thanks, everybody.